In this video, we're going to look at antibodies. Antibodies are plasma proteins known as immunoglobulins. Now, to understand the different immunoglobulins we have in our body, I feel like it's most natural to know where they come from first, right? So we got our B cells right here, right? Chilling in the cortex of the lymph node. I'll show you a scheme later. B cells have what is called B cell receptors on the surface, composed of either IgD or IgM antibodies, which are membrane bound and a signal transducer, that's a heterodimer called IgA and IgB. Those are those uh, transmit the signal to the nucleus when the IgD or IgM binds to something, right? So now let's imagine this antigen right here was just catched from the interstitial fluid from the lymph vessel and then brought to the cortex of the lymph node. And it was unlucky enough to accidentally fit to the membrane bound antibody on the surface of the B cell. It's then gonna perform an antigen B cell receptor endocytosis and present a fragment of the antigen on the MHC class two molecule. Remember, B cells are also antigen presenting cells too. At the same time, a dendritic cell can also phagocyte the antigen and eventually present it on the MHC class two molecule. Remember, Dendritic cells and B cells are both professional antigen presenting cells because they can present fragments of peptides to T cells and the MHC class 2 molecule. Now the dendritic cell is going to present the fragment on the MHC class molecule to a naive T helper cell. So the naive T helper cell will dock to the MHC class 2 molecule with its T cell receptor and this hook that works kind of an anchor is called CD4. Um, and CD4 is very good at binding to MHC class 2 molecules. Then it will send a signal to an, the nucleus through the CD3 molecule. This whole thing is what we call TCR MHC complex. And I haven't really talked about this yet. I'll go through it in details when I go through the antigen presenting cells. But all antigen presenting cells express B7, which binds to CD28 on the T helper cell. That's a very important co-receptors to signal to the T helper cell to actually differentiate into either TH1 or TH2. Then after it binds to B7 through CD28, it will start expressing interleukin-4 receptors, which is also very important in differentiating a naive T helper cell to a T helper cell 2. And the interleukin-4 is usually secreted out by um, other T helper cells too, or mast cells or basophils, or it can also actually sometimes be secreted out by the naive T helper cell itself, which can bind to its own um, interleukin-4 receptor. It's called an adtocrine function, right? Now, after it's, it's received interleukin-4, it will then start to, to secrete out interleukin-2, which will bind to its own receptor. That's also called an adtocrine function. The interleukin-2 is going to help the naive T helper cell to grow, and proliferate and differentiate um, into an active T helper cell 2. It's going to differentiate into many T helper cell 2, right? And then after it it's differentiates and, and proliferates, it's going to help the initial active B, B cell to proliferate. Remember, B cells is also an antigen presenting cell. If this dendritic cells wasn't there, this B cell could do exactly the same as what the antigen presenting cells did to the naive T helper cell, right? Uh, it also expresses B7. Now, after the T helper cells get active, it expresses something called CD40 ligand, which will bind to CD40 on the active B cell. So when a B cell gets activated after it binds to an antigen, it starts expressing CD40. CD40, CD40 ligand, those two, when they're connected, those are very important co-receptors that help the B cell differentiate. Now what happens? T helper cell 2 is going to secrete interleukin 4, it's going to secrete interleukin 5, it's going to secrete interleukin 6 and interleukin 10. And uh, T helper cell 1 can secrete out interleukin 2 or interferon uh, gamma. Each one of these are responsible to what kind of antibody this B cell is going to start to release. Now, if we need more immunoglobulins type A, for example, in the mucous membranes, T helper cell 2 will release will release more interleukin-5. If we need more IgG, T helper cell 2 will release more interleukin-4, and even interferon gamma from the T helper cell 1 will trigger the IgG production, right? So it doesn't really receive all of those at once. Now, this B cell can start dif to differentiate into a plasma cell, which secretes immunoglobulins. 
and also it's going to differentiate into a memory B cell in case we were to get exposed to the same type of antigen in the future for quicker response. Those antibodies will go bind to the antigen which will neutralize them, kind of inhibiting them, uh, if that makes sense. It will also opsonize them, make it easier for white blood cells that can phagocyte to bind and then actually engulf this antigen and even activate the classical pathway of the complement system, right? So that's how they're produced. Antibodies look like this, right? What's the components? Let's use its diagram to help us make it easier. I'll show only one half of the immunoglobulin. The other half is identical, right? An antibody has a light chain, that's the one in yellow, and a heavy chain, that's the one in green, right? It has a variable portion, that's, that's the first two. It's kind of logical when you think about it because that's where the antigen is going to bind. So it has to be variable because different antibodies bind different uh, antigens. And it has a constant region, which is constant. Now we can fill up variable plus light chain equals VL. Constant plus LC equals CL. Variable plus heavy chain equals VH. Constant plus heavy chain equals CH1, CH2, and CH3, right? It's not really that hard if you think about it. The CL and CH1 is connected through disulfide bonds, and there are also bonds here connecting the two parts of the antibody, and they form this hinge region. The hinge is really important because it allows the antibody to bind to anti antigens much efficiently, as you see right here in this picture. So, you know these two floppy upper parts? They're called FAB, that stands for Fragment Antigen Binding, and it can bind different epitopes in the antigen, depending on the variable region. The lower part is FC, I call it F constant, but it really stands for Fragment Crystallizable Region for some reason. The FC region is where macrophages can bind and complement system. Now, I will try not to confuse you too much here, but the antibody has domains, right? The variable domain are where the antigen binds. CH1 region determines the allotype. Um, I'll get more into that later in this video, but allotype is when two of the same type of antibody has different CH1 region, because their alleles of the same constant gene differs. But don't worry too much about that right now. All right, CH2 domains is where the C1 of the complement system binds. CH3 domains is where cells with FC receptor binds, like the macrophages, B lymphocytes, and mast cells, for example. Now, this is the most important part. Antibodies have different variants of chains, right? The light chain, here in yellow, can be either lambda chain or, or kappa chain. There are really no functional difference between them. But the heavy chain, though, this is the most important part, because we're going to have five different types of immunoglobulins in our body, at least what we know of, gamma, mi, alpha, delta, and epsilon chain. That stands for IgG, IgM, IgA, IgD, and IgE. Now let's go through each and every one of these and see what their characteristics are, right? The IgG, or the antibody with gamma chain, exists only as a monomer. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail into this, but IgG also has subclasses. It has IgG 1 to 4. Now, if you would analyze your blood, you would see that around 75% of the immunoglobulins in your plasma are going to be IgG antibodies. IgG is the only antibody that gives us passive immunity from our mother by placenta transfer before we we're born. Because of that, you know, the x-axis is going to be the age in month. And the y-axis here shown in percent is going to be the concentration of immunoglobulins we have in our plasma. Now, when we were first born, all the immunoglobulins we have in our blood is going to be IgG, and those are from our mothers, right? As you see here, this decreased slightly towards uh, when we reach six months, and then they increase because we start to develop our own adaptive immunity. IgG can either help with a direct obsonization, can help phagocytes actually bind to the uh, microorganism, and they're also really, really good at activating the classical pathway of the, of the complement system. So um, that's IgG. IgM is a special one. It's mostly found as a pentamer bound together by a J chain, as you see here. 
You can also find these as a monomer bound to the surface of B cells. IgM is what we call the youngest class because the fetus can actually produce those on their own. And you can see it doesn't really start from zero concentration when we're born. Cool, right? It's most probably because IgM can be produced without the help of T cells. I'll get more into that later. Now, there's one thing I have to talk about when I mention IgM and IgG. I'm not going to talk too much about it as uh, it's for another topic in the future video. But, you know, let's say this is you, right? Uh, when you get infected by a bacteria, so it's the first antigen exposure, right? The IgM is going to react first. That, that's called the primary response. While the second exposure, after you've, be, you've recovered and around 28 days have passed, the same reaction happens. IgM doesn't really give you any sort of memory since T cells are not involved in production of IgM. B cells can just differentiate into IgM producing plasma cells when they bind to the antigen. And because there is no T cells involved, no memory B cells are, are produced. IgG, on the other hand, they will react the same way in the primary humoral response. Um, as you see, it starts a little later because the process of getting IgG is a little longer because it involves T cells. But they will form memory B and T cells for a quicker and stronger immune response in the secondary humoral immune response during the second exposure. Um, right. What else can IgM do? It can activate the complement system the same way as IgG does. And they do exist as monomers on the surface of B cells. Remember, the B cells have BCR receptors, which compose of either IgM or IgD. So uh, that's IgM. Next, IgA. IgA are found dimeric, also with a J chain. And it's mostly found at the portals of entry. So this is the mucosal epithelium right here. Uh, on the left, there's the lamina propria and the lumen to the right. So uh, I hope you kind of get a sort of an image of uh, what we're looking at right now. I'm really bad at animating things. So in lamina propria, you can have plasma cells or what we call alpha plasma cells because these plasma cells are specialized in secretion of IgA antibodies and they're gonna bind to the epithelium with the help of um, what is called poly IgA receptors and be transported through the cytoplasm via endocytosis. And then they're gonna be secreted out through proteolytic cleavage to attack any type of specific bacteria or virus they were initially produced against. Now keep in mind that IgA is the predominant immunoglobulin in the seromucus, such as the saliva, milk, uh, tracheo, bronchial, and genitourinal secretion. Also, I'm not going to go into too much detail into this, but there are two subclasses also, IgA1 and IgA, IgA2, but we will leave it like that. Um, one thing though is that Many microorganisms have adapted to the environment in the upper respiratory tract, releasing uh, proteins that cleaves IgA, those sneaky little things. You may find them as monomeric or trimeric as well. In terms of concentration, IgA represents roughly, roughly about 15 to 20 percent of adult human serum immunoglobulin pool because most of them are found in the mucus. Next, we have IgD. We have very low amount of them in the serum, under 1%, and the reason is that most of them are found on the surface of B cells, or on the surface of mature B cells to be exact. They exist therefore mostly as monomeric. The precise role of IgD is a little unclear yet, but they are on the surface of B cells, so they do help them bind and differentiate. Other studies have found that they increase in number of IgD during autoimmune diseases, during chronic inflammation, and also um, increases in amount if there are any source of tumors. That's really all I had for IgD. Uh, IgD IgE, on the other hand, is very low amount in the blood as well because they exist uh, as monomers found on the surface of mast cells and basophils. And they play a role in type 1 hypersensitivity in allergic reactions. And the first step of obtaining IgE is through sensitization. Sensitization is the first step of allergies. It's when, let's say you breathe in pollen, for example, for the first time, and then the pollen is going to get into the mucus, mucosal epithelium presented to antigen-presenting cells. 
and then that's going to cause an immune response producing IgE. So um, because of that, you will find an increased amount in allergic disorders and also um, parasite infections as well. So um, that was all the antibodies. Now, there is one more thing I wanted to talk about. There are some differences between the antibodies. We can have idiotypic differences where the uh, antibody differs in their variable region, like um, the one you see right here, for example. Both IgG bind to different antigens. Uh, we can also have isotypic differences where antibodies differ in their constant regions. And we can have allotypic differences, remember that one? Where we can have two of the same IgG, but they're going to have differences between them because they have different alleles of the same constant genes uh, that codes for uh, CH1. So lastly, I made this list. I hope it can be a little helpful to you. We can go through everything together right now, just quickly. Um, IgG right here is mainly monomer, and it you'll find most of it in the serum, around 70 to 75%. And their role is to opsonize, to activate a complement, remember. And remember, you receive them passively from your mother during fetal life through the placenta. So a passive immunity in newborn, right? IgM, in the other hand, you can find them as a pentameric circulating in your blood or monomeric on the surface of B cells. Around 10% you'll find them in the serum. And they can activate the complement system and they can also bind to antigens surface and opsonize as well. IgD, on the other hand, those are exist as monomers. It's logical because you'll mostly find them on the surface of B cells. But you'll also find some of them in the serum under 1%. And um, they come from B cell development and their role is also related to B cells as well. Uh, IgA, mostly dimeric. You can find them as trimeric and monomeric, but they exist mostly in the mucosal lumen and also some of them in the serum, uh, 15 to 20%. Their role is to protect you from microorganisms by agglutinating the microorganisms at the, at the lumen of, uh, of the mucosal surface, right? Lastly, IgE exists only as monomeric on the surface of mast cells and also basophils in the tissues. And you can also find fragments of them in the serum under 1% as well. And these guys are against parasites and they cause anaphylactic shock by activating mast cells or basophils into releasing their mediators, which cause uh, anaphylactic shock. So um, that was mainly everything I wanted to talk about. My only tips is that if you write down this table several times, maybe um, you will then remember the antibodies easier.